Morning everybody, this is our lecture for week four. This is the the two hour endocrine or the two unit I should say endocrinology lecture. And sorry my voice is a little hoarse this morning. And my main mic isn't working, so we're using the onboard mic, so I apologize if that doesn't sound the greatest, but here we go. So we've been talking about Kahn's syndrome, also known as hyperaldosteronism or primary aldosteronism all AKAs we said that the most common cause is a condition where the endocrine gland or with where the adrenal gland becomes overgrown with adenomas which are tumors specifically these tumors are made of of glomerulosa cells Right? We know glomerulosa cells are the ones that secrete aldosterone. And we showed you a picture of that last time. The adrenal glands get quite large and lumpy looking. And yeah, that's called bilateral because it usually occurs bilaterally. Idiopathic adrenal gland hyperplasia. Uh, we said you can order an aldosterone to renin activity test. Uh, to make the diagnosis, that would be a very high ratio of uh, aldosterone to renin, maybe just a number out of the blue, 50 parts aldosterone to 2 parts renin. That's not true for secondary adrenalism, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, the most common clinical finding in someone with Kahn's syndrome is hypertension. And that's because, of course, aldosterone causes the reabsorption of sodium and the reabsorption of water. Uh, that, that's the effect through the principal cells in the kidney, and we talked a lot about that. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that it's not an, uh, the reabsorption of salt and water is not equal. Uh, patients will absorb more sodium overall than water. So they do get a buildup of sodium in their blood, so they become hypernatremic, or, or their blood becomes hyperosmolalic, or hyper, uh, they're hyper -os have hyperosmolarity, whichever word you want to use. Um, and that's because normally, when angiotensin II is at work, it causes the reabsorption of salt and water, and it causes reabsorption of free water through the release of ADH. ADH is not involved here in Kahn syndrome, so therefore we have kind of a lopsided uh, intake of sodium compared to water. That's why they get hypernatremic. Uh, we said they also become, this makes sense, they develop metabolic alkalosis, and sometimes even hypokalemia, uh, because we know the, the job of aldosterone is to reabsorb salt and water and kick out or excrete potassium and hydrogen ion. Then the strange, one that's hard to explain, but is another common clinical finding, is polyuria. So they're urinating all the time, and we're not exactly sure why. Some of the th leading theories are that somehow the hyperaldosteronism uh, makes the principal cell resistant to ADH, and therefore you don't get a reabsorption of free water, and that water goes right out into the urine. All right. Um, we also said that the hypokalemia, although for boards and stuff, they like to say, talk about hypokalemia and tetanus, muscle tetany muscle weakness, fasciculations. In reality, it's not always there, so you can't rely on it. You know, if you suspect it, if they have hypertension, you should really order uh, this aldosterone to run an activity test to rule it out. Don't wait for the hypokalemia to show up because they'll. by the time it shows up, they may have damaged their heart uh, because we know the heart does not like high levels of aldosterone. All right, um, yep, it causes heart, it makes the heart muscles get very twitchy, weak but twitchy. 
hypocalemia. Uh, the treatment is the same for secondary aldosteronism. Um, it's aldoctone, which is a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. And we said make sure you know the difference between an agonist and an antagonist. Antagonists are blockers. Uh, so this blocks the receptors uh, that aldosterone would use to bind to. An agonist would bind to that receptor and put the cell in agony, make the, ce make the cell do work, is how I think of it. Um, antagonists are blockers. Agonists are, maker, are, are, are when they bind, they cause the cell to do something. Um, if this doesn't work, then you have to take the disease glands out. So surgical excision and the patient will have to be on tablets. All right, so that's basically the recap of primary aldosteronism. So let's talk about secondary aldosteronism or secondary hyperaldosteronism, if you will. Um, and I mean, the result is the same. We still have an over secretion of aldosterone, but the cause is different. There's nothing wrong with the adrenal gland. Let me say that again. In secondary aldosteronism, there's nothing wrong with the adrenal gland. The problem is the R2A system. Uh, it's, it's caused by an overactive, chronically turned on R2A system. Namely, the R2A system ultimately makes the little Tasmanian devil angiotensin II. And we talked about that for a whole lecture, uh, all the effects of that, right? It's a, it's a monster. It can also wreck the heart just like just like aldosterone. I mean, if you're bleeding and you, your blood pressure drops, it's it's needed. It's a life-saving mechanism. Um, but the trouble is when it's chronically turned on, it has all kinds of negative effects. We talked about those before, including blood clotting, hypertension, and damages the heart. All right, um, what are the causes of secondary aldosteronism then? Well, really, Anything that causes uh, hypotension um, yeah. or hypo, that should be hypovolemia on slide 7, right? low, low blood volume, or hypervolemia, yeah, hypotension, hypovolemia, that should be. Um, so let's look at some of these. Uh, kidney disease. So basically, any condition that causes low blood pressure uh, will could ultimately cause secondary hyper uh, secondary hyperaldosteronism. So let's look at kidney disease, uh, especially something called the nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, uh, the glomerulus leaks albumin, which is should not happen. Uh, and if you lose albumin, and when I say glomerulus leaks albumin, that means it goes right into the filtrate and you urinate it right out. Without albumin around you are you're not going to be able to return blood fluid or interstitial fluid back into the capillary back into the bloodstream and so you have a micro swelling all over your body and that's going to drop blood pressure drop blood pressure turns on the r2a system turn which ultimately releases angiotensin 2 which stimulates stimulates glomerulosa cells in the zone of glomerulosa uh, and there's your increased aldosterone. Same another kidney problem, late stage renal failure. So if the kidneys when the kidneys start to fail and break down, the glomerulus doesn't filter very good uh, and you also lose uh, albumin and you be, you get hypoalbuminemia because it's leaked out into the kidney and you've urinated it out. Same story. Liver disease, same story. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, the liver is where albumin is made, and as the liver cells start to die and don't work, you don't make enough albumin. And the same story, hypoalbuminemia, uh, there goes your blood pressure, renin's released in response, renin's converted uh, into angiotensin 1, and angiotensin's converted into angiotensin 2 via ACE, and ultimately that causes angiotensin 2 stimulates glomerulosa cells to release aldosterone. All right, uh, let's see, what else can it do? Some causes. 
any we talked about this before as well any any cardiomyopathy heart failure and there's many different types of it but if the heart is not putting out because it's sick or maybe you have a aortic stenosis and you just can't get blood out of the heart for whatever reason uh, that decreases uh, the stroke volume and it decreases cardiac output and if that happens well that's hypotension and then that same scenario goes you increase renin increase angiotensin 2 increase aldosterone so failing heart can do it then we have this kind of oddball one um, super super rare I hesitate to put it in here uh, but occasionally once in a blue moon as they say back in the day um, you can get a tumor that is in places other than the adrenal gland and it secretes renin so that's an ectopic if it's not in the zone of glomerulosa and you have cells secreting aldosterone that's an ectopic tumor so ectopic renin secretion um, that could also turn uh, do the same thing all right if you if you secrete renin that's going to drive the angiotensin 2 system I don't need to go through that again so and that's the only one that's not caused from hypotension that's super super rare though okay um, another one chronic diarrhea from let's say you got a parasite you went down south and picked up a parasite and now you're uh, have diarrhea all the time uh, well diarrhea I mean if the cells, the enterocytes are irritated and not reabsorbing water, remember we said think of the intestine um, just as the distal convoluted tubules and collecting duct. That's the same type of principle. They reabsorb salted water as well uh, in response to aldosterone. And so if those cells are broken and not reabsorbing water, you have a lot of water going out um, in your fecal material. That's diarrhea. And so if you're not reabsorbing water into the body, that's going to decrease blood pressure eventually, and there goes the whole R2A system. Ultimately causes the increase of secretion of aldosterone. Hyperhidrosis, some people sweat way too much, and if you sweat too much and don't replace it with uh, water, there goes your blood pressure, and that same mechanism goes on again. Some more causes. Uh, Fibromuscular dysplasia, so any anything that narrows the renal artery and causes a downstream or decreased flow of blood downstream or an ischemia or an insufficiency an arterial insufficiency which affects the kidney if the kidney doesn't get enough pressure um, the r2a system gets turned on and that same story goes again coarctation of the aorta we've talked about before that's where you get a congenital narrowing of that infundibular region of the aorta which is right um, right after the aortic arch uh, and if that's bad enough it'll decrease blood flow to the entire lower half of the body including the kidneys and if you decrease blood flow to the kidneys you turn on the R2A system and there you go all right um, what about the aldosterone to renin ratio? And here's a good testable type tidbit you have to know. Uh, how's the aldosterone to renin ratio? It's, it's the opposite in secondary aldosteronism uh, because renin is the problem. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, in this example, we had five, five parts of aldosterone to three parts of renin. Um, and that's not what we saw before before we saw a very high aldosterone to renin uh, maybe 1000 milligram, uh, milligrams per deciliter of aldosterone to 100 milligrams so those are random numbers um, so the ratio will be low okay so make sure make note cards make sure you know that one secondary aldosteronism has a low aldosterone to renin ratio primary aldosteronism has a high aldosterone to renin ratio. All right, let's see. I think we got all that. The only note, though, um, that super rare ectopic renin secreting tumor uh, that would 
Um, no, that would still have a high renin tildosterone ratio because it's secreting renin. So I gotta fix that. I just made some of these slides last night, so just kind of reworded these. Um, so we can cross that out, number 11 there. Right, so that would be true because you're secreting renin. Even though it's not really from the R2A system. Uh, what are the signs and symptoms? They're exactly the same as primary aldosteronism, hyper, or, um, hypertension, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis. We explained all those things. Um, let's see, which one am I missing? Hypertension, uh, hypernatremia um, as well. I think I forgot that one there. Uh, unique symptoms would be a decreased aldosterone to renin ratio and then the diseased organ that is causing the problem we don't see that in con syndrome so kidney disease heart disease liver disease gastrointestinal disease so those are unique symptoms uh, easy for me to make a test question on that slide wasn't it treatment is the same as primary aldosteronism it's uh, aldactone which is a aldosterone antagonist and that's the question. I'll probably put agonist and see if you can tell the difference between those two. So watch out for those. Uh, what's the fix, the other fix? Uh, well, it, it, no, you don't take out the, the adrenal gland like you do in primary. Uh, you have to try to fix the kidney disease, liver disease, heart disease, or find the ectopic tumor, or fix the, the decrease blood flow to the kidney if possible so there might be a solution to this one all right that's enough about that let's switch gears let's start talking about antidiuretic hormone adh we've talked a little bit about it but let's get into the weeds on it um, also known as vasopressin i will use those change in, in uh, those terms interchangeably another one is called arginine vasopressin Usually when there's very high levels of ADH, the report will talk about arginine vasopressin. That's still an AKA. Arginopressin is another one. You don't see that often, but some authors use that one as well. Uh, ADH is released from the posterior pituitary. Its, its structure, biochemically speaking, is very similar to that of oxytocin. Uh, both of these are, those are the two hormones that come from the posterior pituitary. I could ask you that. You've had endocrinology before, so I assume you remember easy stuff like that. Uh, ADH is the key hormone for controlling water homeostasis. And what does ADH do? It signals the kidney to conserve or reabsorb or suck water free water out of the filtrate right so out of the uh, the pre-urine some people call it the filtrate the weird thing here about ADH is sodium does not follow we know aldosterone binds to principal cells and causes the reabsorption of salt and water but if ADH binds to that same principal cell it causes the reabsorption of water but not sodium uh, so that's a little little strange. Um, and the other weird thing, if you have really high concentrations of ADH running around in the blood, they can start causing a vasoconstriction of arterioles and venules in the skin and the muscles and in other places. Um, so very similar to epinephrine. Uh, where does it come from? Predominantly magnocellular neurons is where it comes from. Um, where do magnocellular neurons live? They live in the hypothalamus, the anterior part of the hypothalamus. How about be more specific? Where do they live? They live in the superoptic nuclei, the SON. Um, and there are a few of them, a few magnocellular neurons actually live in the paraventricular nuclei, which is confusing because parvocellular neurons, which uh, make CRH, also live in the paraventricular nuclei. We'll get to that. 
Um, it's a little strange situation because the cell body lives in those nuclei and magnocellular neurons. The ADH is created and then it's transported down a very long axon and it's kind of hangs out uh, in the end of the axon uh, and is released into the blood. It is not made in the posterior pituitary. Now, like other hormones, many hormones are made in the anterior pituitary. Uh, in fact, there are no hormones that I know of that are made in the posterior pituitary. They all are made in the hypothalamus and are transported down axons. Another softball question. Paraventricular nuclei is right there. There's the sun. Supraoptic nuclei right there. So most magnocellular neurons are hanging out here. There's a couple of them here. Um, and they all send their long axons down to the posterior pituitary. Here's a nice picture. Magnocellular neurons hanging out. There's a few of them here in the, in the uh, paraventricular nuclei. Um, there's most of them are in the supraoptic nuclei. Uh, and the ADH is made here in the hypothalamus. And then it's transported down these long axons all the way down. It can be stored in these little uh, endings here of the nerves if need be. Usually it just is immediately released. Uh, into the the so the venous or into the venous system here in the posterior pituitary and it's off into the bloodstream. I guess this way is to the blood. I guess the flow of blood is here. All right. I think you guys usually know that. Are there different types of magnocellular neurons? Some magnocellular neurons uh, in the supraoptic nuclei also make oxytocin. So they don't all make ADH. So, so magnus, there's different flavors of magnocellular neurons. In fact, about 3% of magnocellular neurons, they're, uh, they're able to make both ADH and oxytocin. Most of them make antidiuretic hormone. Uh, but some of them just make oxytocin, and some of them are able to do both. Let's fall down a rabbit hole now. We should talk about parvocellular neurons. I guess it's as good as time as any to talk about them. Um, these are like all, like magnocellular neurons. These are neuroendocrine uh, neurons. Um, they live mainly in the paraventricular nuclei. Uh, there's a few up in the suprachiasmic nuclei and other places in the brain which we're still a little shaky on what they do. So there are other ones around uh, in the CNS. The main ones we care about live in the uh, paraventricular nuclei. The claim to fame, they make corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. What does CRH do? Uh, well, that's in the end, that, that goes down into the anterior pituitary, it binds to granulosa cells, not glomerulosa cells, watch out for that one, granulosa cells. Granulosa cells are the ones that make um, ACTH. And ACTH, of course, will go and bind uh, to the adrenal gland and cause the release of cortisol and DHEA as well. We'll get, we'll, you don't have to write that down. We'll get to that as the course goes on. Um, now, another weird thing about these parvocellular neurons, they don't have those super long axons. Um, so their, their neurons are short and stubby. They actually dump into something called the hypothesial portal system. Uh, and that, that venous system takes uh, the, takes its, product hormone CRH down to the anterior pituitary where its receptors are and it binds. So the axons do not go all the way into the pituitary gland like the magnocellular neurons do. Let's take a look at these. Here's magnocellular neurons. I demonstrated my amazing Photoshop skills again. Put little blue things around. Um, so Superoptic nuclei would be this region here. 
parvocillian neurons, long axons. ADH is made here. Great. In the part in the paraventricular nuclei here in red, uh, you can see we we actually have a magnocellular neuron, but we have these little little shorties here. Those are parvocellular neurons, uh, and they're making CRH. They dump CRH into this hypothesial portal system, and it's taken down lickety split goes really fast down uh, into this uh, this system here, um, and the granulosa cells are everywhere here. And so the CRH binds to granulosa cells uh, and granulosa cells spit out ACTH and ACTH comes out here, goes down to the adrenal gland, stimulates that to make cortisol and DHEA. This is endocrinology fun. What do they do, parvocellular neurons? We already said they release cortical tropin releasing hormone or CRH. CRH triggers corticotroph cells and pituitary to release ACTH. ACTH stimulates the adrenal gland, uh, of course, to everything I just said, release cortisol and DHA. Or you could say the uh, adrenal steroid or the adrenal androgens, uh, androstenedione. You have to be careful of that one because all the different authors may might use uh, a different uh, product for this. Uh, that's the zona reticularis product. Um, some may just say the adrenal androgens because that's where testosterone and estrogen come from. Uh, that's where females get their testosterone, or testosterone from. We'll get to that though. Um, uh oh, there's a little, haven't seen that since embryology, have we? The little scary man. Um, so it's always confusing not just CRH. So there is a subtype of parvocellular neuron that still lives in the paraventricular nuclei. There's still a subtype um, that actually is not released into the posterior pituitary. Um, I call it, just to keep things straight, I call it ADHP. But So parvocellular neurons make CRH, but there is a subtype that actually makes antidiuretic hormone. But this antidiuretic hormone does not go to the posterior pituitary. Instead, it follows the same path as CRH. Um, it goes down uh, into that, that portal system and is transported via venous blood down to the granulosa cells. And this ADH can actually bind to glomerulosa cells. Did I say glomeruli uh, granulosa cells? I've got to make sure I keep those two straight myself granulosa cells, it binds to granulosa cells um, just like CRH does and it helps stimulate these corticotroph cells to release ACTH. It should be granulosa cells. Yeah, it should be granulosa cells. I have to fix that. We've got some bugs here I'm catching this time. Um, so parvocellular neurons release CRH. So bottom line, parvocellular neurons release CRH and uh, antidiuretic hormone. Call it, that's my terminology though to keep it straight, ADHP. But I won't use that in the test because that won't be on boards. Um, Parvocellular neurons also release just more things they do, thyroid releasing hormone or thyrotropin releasing hormone or TRH and that goes down to the anterior pituitary uh, to stimulate cells to release uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone and prolactin as well. So those parvocellular neurons are busy little cells. What stimulates ADH's manufacturing and release? Um, that's a good question. That's an important question. Salty blood. So hyperosmolalic or hyperosmolarity. You could say hypernatremia. Salty blood. If you have too many molecules of sodium compared to water, you have salty blood. You have hyperosmolalic blood or hypernatremic blood. Um, that'll stimulate it. We'll look at exactly how that works. 
in a while. Angiotensin II has receptors uh, on magnocellular neurons and it can bind and directly cause them to release ADH. Hypotension. Magnocellular neurons, amazing cells, they're actually sensitive to pressure. Uh, so fairly new research. Uh, if pressure drops like it does in hypotension, the magnocellular neurons can sense that all by themselves and release ADH. So that's kind of cool. ADH, where does it go? Uh, in general, it goes to the kidneys, um, to the principal cells. It binds to the principal cells and it causes the reabsorption of free water. We've said that. Um, it also helps stimulate release of ACTH. We said that as well from granulosa cells. That would be, uh, that would be the ADH uh, from the parvocellular neurons. Normally, that's not that important of a mechanism, but in stress, this mechanism causes all sorts of trouble, as we'll get to. Uh, what about dehydration? Yep, ADH is the main defender against just run-of-the-mill, moderate, slight to moderate dehydration. Now, how can that possibly work? Well, mild to moderate dehydration typically causes the loss of water without as much loss of sodium. Let me say that again. So run-of-the-mill dehydration, you really are, have lost more water than you have sodium. Uh, so if you've lost more water, you got salty blood again. You've lost water molecules, too many sodium molecules around salty blood, or hypernatremic uh, blood, or hypernatremia. Um, yes, you would have hypovolemia in this case because you've lost the water. All right, so here's a little chart. You've probably had this before, but I assume you know all this stuff. So there's a run-of-the-mill uh, dehydration where you've lost more water than you have salt. causes increased blood osmolality or molarity, either one. It also decreases the volume because you've lost water. That's going to turn on the R2A system, turn on angiotensin 2. I don't think I need to go all through this stuff as we've talked about it. But yeah, so kind of a bottom line the magnocellular neurons are really double stimulated by the release of ADH, or, or to release ADH uh, by a decreased blood pressure and hypernatremia. So kind of a double. All right, let's talk about higher levels of ADH. Um, so when, when you have high levels of ADH in the blood, the, the lab people tend not to call it ADH anymore. They call, tend to call it arginine vasopressin or vasopressin. It's still ADH. It's just a confusing type thing. Uh, so in high enough quantities, ADH can cause a powerful vasoconstriction of arterioles and venules. It's at least ten, or at least ten times more powerful than even norepinephrine's effect on the tunica media, which we've studied before. Uh, so it's very powerful. Uh, this only happens with high levels of ADH, though. If you have run-of-the-mill levels of ADH, you'll get reabsorption of free water, uh, but you won't uh, get this effect. So how does this mechanism work? Well, there's two types of receptors we should know. Uh, there's a type 1, a V1 receptor for ADH, and there's a V2 receptor for ADH. The V1 receptors are on the smooth muscle cells of arterioles and venules. These V1 receptors have a very low affinity for ADH. What does that mean, low affinity? That means that they're, they don't dock, they don't bind very good with ADH. There's got to be a lot of ADH for enough binding to occur to set these things off. On the other side of the coin, we have these V2 receptors. These are the ones that are in principal cells. These have a high affinity for ADH. Uh, and so a little bit of ADH can bind to these really easily. Here's a cartoon of this. So here's a, uh, 
smooth muscle cell and there is a V1 receptor. Super high levels of ADH or arginine vasopressin, aka, or vasopressin, whichever one you want to use. Um, it can finally start to bind uh, to these V1 receptors. Once it binds, it causes a powerful contraction, 10 times stronger than norepinephrine's effect. Uh, and it'll really clamp down on the arterioles and venules. In the kidney, we have the V2 receptor um, that has very high affinity. A little bit of ADH around won't affect this one, but it'll definitely bind to this one, cause the reabsorption of free water. Uh, what blood vessels are affected? We said this already, uh, skin and muscle um, and intestine, but let's go through it. Uh, so just like epinephrine, ADH triggers blood vessels in the dermis of the skin. Uh, it shuts off blood flow uh, by shutting off the dermal venous plexus. How does it do that? It actually opens up these things called AV shunts. Let's take a look at this system. Um, so normally we have here's an arterial, here's the skin, here's the dermis, and we have this capillary system under here and venous um, system under here. And uh, if you're really hot, if your core is really hot, this is, full, this is open full blast and you have a lot of blood going up into the skin here. Um, but if you have a lot of ADH around, um, it can co open up these little bypass shunts here. Um, these are called AV anastomosis, arteriovenous anastomosis. And therefore the blood is rerouted it doesn't go this way anymore. It's rerouted through these right back into the venule uh, and it's, uh, it bypasses the skin. So you don't have a lot of blood and there's miles and miles of these capillaries. So you're saving all this blood rerouted back to the core. Same way epinephrine works. Okay, and that'll immediately boost blood pressure if you shut off the skin because that you're not, you're not don't have to supply the skin. You can save that blood to, to boost up the pressure. Okay, there's some other targets. Skeletal muscle, um, the mesenteric vessels that supply the intestines, they can also be shut off this exact same method uh, to conserve blood for the core. Uh, what about hypernatremia? We should say a word about that. Uh, we said that salty blood, hypernatremic blood, hyperosmolalic, hyperosmolaric blood, um, salty blood. Um, that can trigger the release of ADH. And there's two main causes of hypernatremia. Uh, you can lose, uh, losing too much body or blood water or blood fluid without an equal loss of sodium. So we said run of the mill dehydration causes a loss of body water uh, without too much loss of sodium, so you get salty blood. Uh, or maybe you gain, you're just gaining too much sodium because you're eating it. You crave salt or you just, you just like potato chips and you eat a bag of potato chips every day. Or use that salt shaker constantly during the day. That can, that can definitely make you hypernatremic as well. The kidney's going to take care of some of that, but um, excessive sweating. Uh, so sweat when you sweat, you lose more water than salt. Um, so that does the same thing. That can make you hypernatremic. Chronic diarrhea, uh, same sort of deal. You lose more water than salt. Can make you hypernatremic. Hyperaldosterone. We already said uh, causes a reabsorption of salt in water, but causes the reabsorption of more salt than water. Diabetes insipidus is a problem with ADH, and we'll get to that one, but uh, if you can't reabsorb free water, you're going to have salty blood, because you need to reabsorb salt in water via aldosterone, and you need to reabsorb free water via ADH to have a nice, perfect mix of salt and water in the blood. What's the mechanism of ADH release uh, with regard to hyperosmolality? So, in other words, um, how does salty blood stimulate the release of, of ADH? 
Well, there's a couple ways. Uh, there are some key osmoreceptors that live very close to the third ventricle of the brain um, in an area called the CVO, the circumventricular nuclei. If you really want to go into the weeds, the, there's two regions within the CVO called the subfornical organ and the organum vasculosum are the areas where this really occurs. I think CVO is probably good enough though. So here's where the CVO lives, right there. Not too far away from the uh, paraventricular nuclei and the supraoptic nuclei here. Right, so what's the deal? How does this work? Uh, there are receptors on neurons uh, that are connected to the internal carotid artery. So small branches from the internal carotid artery actually feed into the CVO and there's some cells there uh, that, uh, kind of like the macula densa, they're tasting. They have the ability to taste the, uh, the blood for salt. And if those, if the if you get an increased osmolarity, or if you get a little raise in salt in the blood, as much as one to two percent, those neurons fire a message uh, over to magnocellular neurons, and they release immediate release ADH. So CVO is one way. Um, that's kind of indirect though, because the CVO neurons, just like the, the macula densa type deal. Um, they sense it, so they have to kind of send a message over to the magnocellular neurons to release ADH. Um, yep, so that's everything I said. Okay, there's a little cartoon of this. Here's the CVO in this cartoon. Here is the internal carotid artery. Here's a small branch. Uh, and then we have some of these, uh, this artery goes right into the CVO. Um, and the cells of the CVO are able to sense the pressure, their baroreceptors, uh, and once, or not the pressure, sorry, their, their chemoreceptors, they sense the salt, they're tasting, they have little snake tongues that taste the blood here, just like macula densa uh, cells. And once they taste the rise in salt, that stimulates them, they send a message over to magnocellular neurons, magnocellular neurons go, whoop, we better release ADH. ADH is released, causes reabsorption of free water, which offsets some of that salty blood. Add some water to it, and it's not salty blood anymore. Um, interesting, magnocellular neurons are also osmoreceptors themselves. Um, so they're amazing cells. Uh, they can, they can sense the saltiness of the blood. They can sense when the blood becomes hyperosmolaric or hyperosmolalic. Uh, and yeah, so that's fairly new research. That's Burton 2015 uh, in um, uh, Nils' uh, physiology book. Or, Bert, or not that familiar with this book, but uh, how would you say that? Nobel and Nils' physiology. Uh, from a paper of Bert, Burton, 2015. Now, Burton was the author of this book. Uh, anyway, it, it is, uh, there's several reference on it, uh, on this phenomenon. But yeah, magnocellular neurons do have the ability. Uh, so they're, they're chemoreceptors, they're osmoreceptors. And they, if the extracellular fluid becomes hyperosmolal or hypoosmolalic, it hyperpolarizes the magnocellular neuron, uh, and that stops the release of ADH. Uh, if it becomes hyperosmolalic, it depolarizes the, the cell membrane of a magnocellular neuron, and that stimulates the release of ADH. So, yeah, so they're osmoreceptors too. Amazing cell type. Okay, deep stuff. That's enough. Email me those questions. You guys usually have questions after this lecture. See you later.